Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's lecture, uh, which arguably forms the centerpiece uh, of this year's celebrations uh, of our 175th anniversary. Uh, I'm Peter Flynn, and I'm the 136th president of this institution. And I'm here in the lecture theatre in Birdcage Walk, with, along with about another dozen or so uh, other people. Uh, I have in my hand uh, a letter which Prince Charles has written to us, uh, congratulating all the members, volunteers and staff uh, on this incredible milestone. Uh, there's no formalities other than to say that if you would like to uh, pose some questions, there is a, an ask, the, ask a question button uh, on, the, on the system. So, on this day, 175 years ago, it was a Wednesday, Wednesday the 27th of January 1847, uh, our institution held its first official meeting. Uh, it was in the Queen's Hotel in Birmingham, uh, a site which in the next year or two will become the uh, part of the terminus of the HS2 uh, high-speed rail line. Uh, the idea of forming an institution, or so the story goes, uh, is believed to uh, originated at a meeting of some railway engineers in the autumn of 1846, uh, and they were on the Licky Incline, which is uh, an infamously steep section of railway line just to the southwest of Birmingham, and, and in fact, I think, still in use today. And uh, four of them put together their thoughts in a small uh, folded letter that did the rounds in October and November uh, of that year. Uh, and we still have that letter in our archives, uh, and we still have, by the way, the minutes of the founding meeting uh, in January of 1847, uh, and you can access that now online. Uh, they proposed that the new institution would help uh, mechanical engineers to develop their skills through meeting uh, and through correspondence. And they, they spoke uh, of giving an impulse to inventions which might be useful to the world or useful to mankind. The, the me first meeting itself uh, consisted of about 30 engineers who formed the first cohort of membership. Uh, and under the initial chairman, chairmanship of uh, a Mr. James E. McConnell, they approved the rules of the new society, uh, and then they elected George Stevenson uh, as our first president, and his portrait, in fact, is just here to my right. Um, Mr. Stevenson had come over from his home uh, at Tapton House near Chesterfield, and he, gave the, he then gave an impromptu account uh, of his life as an engineer, uh, after which the meeting was closed and they retired. And according to the minutes, they had uh, an evening of the utmost conviviality. So the, the minutes, by the way, are well worth reading, but the language is, uh, is quite, uh, quite quaint. So from these rather modest beginnings, we've now grown to an institution of some 115,000 members uh, spread around the world. In fact, we have members in about three quarters of the nations of this world. And did we succeed in giving inventions which might be useful to the world? Well, in 1847, railways were certainly coming to the fore, uh, but no one had heard about uh, automobiles, washing machines, electricity, or, or telephones for that matter. Uh, and it's easy to forget just how far we've come in terms of the, our standard of living since then, uh, much of which has resulted from the efforts of engineers and manufacturers. Uh, and I don't need to remind you that how the, the food that we eat, the, the transport that we use, uh, the buildings that we live in, or especially relevant today, the medicines and the vaccines that we take uh, are all dependent on engineers and their work. Uh, and at the same time, of course, we should also recognise progress in other fields. Uh, so, for example, over that same period, life expectancy uh, has almost doubled and infant mortality uh, has improved by some, a factor of between 10 and 20. Uh, and the number of major diseases have been uh, eliminated, um, such as smallpox and polio, uh, all with a, a substantial input from engineers. But we now live in a world that faces different challenges, uh, with climate change being the most obvious. Uh, we do have solutions, at least in developmental form, uh, to overcome most of these problems. Which technologies will eventually be adopted for particular situations will depend on a sort of process of natural selection. 
based around what works well uh, and what is the cost effectiveness of, of those different technologies. But based on what's been achieved since 1847, uh, I'm personally very optimistic that we will be successful in the years to come. Uh, and there's certainly plenty for engineers to do, uh, and there's certainly no shortage of funding either. Which brings me on to this evening's lecture. Uh, the engineer's role in turning ideas into cost-effective solutions uh, has been the uh, speaking topic for my presidential year. Uh, and very appropriately, uh, this evening's lecture is entitled Harnessing the Power of Engineering to Solve Global Challenges. Uh, and we're very pleased indeed to uh, welcome Sir Patrick Valance to address us uh, on this uh, important topic. Uh, Sir Patrick trained, as we know, in medicine uh, and uh, worked as a practicing clinician and taught uh, initially in medical research in, in London. He then moved into R&D in the um, pharmaceutical industry, uh, including a six-year period as the head of R&D in GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, and since 2018, he has been the chief scientific advisor to the UK government, where, among other duties, he has professional responsibility for scientists and engineers. Uh, he was first knighted in 2019, uh, and in the UK, he is probably best known for his uh, early evening TV appearances with the Prime Minister on the COVID situation. Uh, but to me, the most uh, um, interesting thing about your career is the fact that you've had direct experience of industry, academia, and government. So, Sir Patrick, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening, uh, and over to you. I'm just going to give you your glass there. Oh, thank, you take, oh, thank, you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Peter. It, it's a really great honour and pleasure to be here to give this talk in the year of the 175th anniversary of this institute. What I wanted to do, though, is go back a bit further. I wanted to go just over 250 years back, again in Birmingham, to the formation of the Lunar Society, whose members affectionately referred to it as the Birmingham Lunatics. They were a mix of engineers, scientists, entrepreneurs, business people, intellectuals, who believed that their role in a period of enlightenment was to know everything there was to know and to do something practical about it. It was people like Josiah Wedgwood, Erasmus Darwin, so Charles Darwin's grandfather, Matthew Bolton, a local businessman, Priestley, James Watt was there, and Benjamin Franklin was an occasional visitor. So fast forward 80 years, and as Peter said, still in Birmingham, you get to another auspicious date of 1847 and the formation of this institute. I was completely struck by their purpose, the purpose to give an impulse to innovation likely to be useful to the world. I want to talk this evening about engineering and global challenges today in 2022, but I'll come back to some of the words in that initial purpose. Invention, the ability to use that invention, and what creates the impulse to allow that to be better. Let me start by saying a little word about my role. I'm the Government Chief Scientific Advisor, and that role is to advise Cabinet and the Prime Minister on all aspects of science and engineering. Now, it's very obvious I cannot personally advise on all aspects of science and engineering and be an expert in those areas. And so there's a network of chief scientific advisors across government. There are many scientists and engineers in government. And of course, there's a massive network outside government that is an important resource into that advice. But one thing I've learned in the four years of being in the role is that there is virtually no area of government policy in which science and engineering doesn't have a part. There are very obvious places where it does have a part. There are engineering problems which government needs to look at. But there are many problems which are not seen as engineering or science problems where a scientist or engineer will have something to add, whether it's a way of thinking or a way of approaching a problem, or in fact, 
whether it's bringing a specific solution or an experimental answer to a problem. And so science and engineering pervades and should pervade government, and it needs to be at the top of its game, something I will come back to. In the title, I talked about global challenges, and I want to just spend a few moments outlining some of the global challenges, which are obvious but important to think about because of this notion that engineering has a purpose in relation to them. The first is changing demography, and this has already been alluded to, but over the last century, the population of the UK alone increased by 20 million. Life expectancy changed from an average of 45 to 75, and when you get to 2000, in the year 2000, 50% of the cohort born in 2000 are expected to live to the age of 100. We now have, in the UK, more people over the age of 65 than under the age of five. In the next decade, it's expected that there will be more people over the age of 65 than between the ages of five and 18. Globally, population growth has slowed and populations in all countries have aged. And traditionally, one thinks of an age pyramid with lots of people at the younger ages and far fewer as you get to the older ages. We're now looking, in most countries, at an age rectangle where the numbers are pretty similar at the beginning and pretty much until the end, and of course they tail off very rapidly right at the end. So we have an aging population with more people living longer, but importantly, more people living longer with disability, with disease, and with multi-comorbidities. So these changes in demography, just on age alone, present enormous challenges and, of course, some opportunities, but challenges of design, of cities, of transport, of healthcare, and many other processes. A second huge challenge, and an obvious one, is the environmental challenge. The world is roughly just over one degree warmer now than it was in the pre-industrial age. Before last year, the previous seven years were the hottest seven years on record. The emissions continue to occur, and the changes caused by the emissions that haven't yet fed through, will feed through into further changes. So we've got a baked-in change ahead of us. Sea levels are rising. Extreme weather events are much more frequent. And not only are they much more frequent, but they are occurring in places that you wouldn't expect. Wildfires in Sweden. Extreme heat waves in Siberia. Land that has previously been inhabitable in part becomes uninhabitable, and we see that that is driving migration in many places. So there are huge imperatives. Stop the change by reducing emissions and angling for net zero as soon as possible. And if we're to keep the change at 1.5 degrees, we've got to do that very, very quickly. We have to stop those emissions. And even if we stop the emissions, the temperature will still increase for a while. And we know that that means we're going to have to adapt as well. It's not just temperature. Biodiversity loss is extreme. It's been described as the sixth mass extinction. The rate of loss of species is hundreds of times higher than you would expect looking historically. And the concept of planetary boundaries, looking at where environmental impacts of pollutants and other things approach a level at which the planet can no longer cope with it is a good way of looking at the impact that we're having and the challenges that we face. There's no doubt that this is a massive global challenge. But there are other types of challenges as well. We live in an increasingly interconnected world and that has brought lots of good. But there are big challenges to how that can occur Smart cities, a great concept with huge challenges to the practical implications of what makes a smart city, and big implications on the downsides, privacy, inequality, 
And right the way across the areas I've talked about, inequalities is a big theme, whether that's in the ageing demography and the numbers of years you spend with disability, whether it's the impact of climate change, or whether it's the impact of interconnectedness and how that might have positive and negative effects. And these are just some examples. Migration is going to be a big issue. We know that water is going to be increasingly an area of global concern. Rare earth elements are important and are going to become difficult to access in some places and are needed for things like battery technologies. Future healthcare, instability, national security. These are issues of global concern that are getting more and more concerning. So just to list those global challenges, the obvious question is, can any of those truly be tackled without invention? To which I think the answer is no, invention is needed. And can inventions be done without engineers? To which the answer is also no. So there's no doubt that engineering has a major central role to play in the global challenges, whichever ones you choose to pick. But I want to come back to one other. And that's a global challenge which has affected all of our lives over the past two years, the pandemic. And I've explained my role, which is to give advice to government, but one bit I missed was part of that advice is during emergencies. And it's worth just perhaps spending a, a moment talking about how the system of emergency response in the UK works. When there is a national emergency of a significant degree, a meeting of COBRA will be called. And COBRA is um, a ministerial committee normally chaired by the Prime Minister. It sounds terribly exotic, actually, but um, COBRA actually stands for Cabinet Office Briefing Room. It's no more exciting than that. But COBRA is called, and COBRA will decide whether <clears throat> the emergency has an angle which requires science or engineering input. And if it does, then SAGE is stood up. And SAGE is the Science Advice Group for Emergencies. It's not a group that pre-exists. It's one that's put together depending on what the emergency is. So in my four years, in the two years before COVID, there were two occasions in which SAGE was called, and one in which we had a, a so-called precautionary SAGE um, before COBRA to see whether um, uh, it was going to be necessary to take it further. So the two examples of SAGE that I'd experienced before the pandemic were one relating to Novichok poisonings, Salisbury, Amesbury, and the second was the Toddbrook Reservoir um, problem where a large reservoir had a dam which looked as though it was going to collapse, and if it had collapsed, a local village and many, much more than a single local village would have been flooded and enormous damage would have occurred. The precautionary sage was actually about Ebola in Africa and particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But in all three of those, there were issues for engineers. And in Toddbrook Reservoir, we had a very urgent need to get engineers in place very quickly to give advice so that ministers could make decisions on what they wanted to do. But the COVID pandemic is the one that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. For me, it started on January the 3rd. I was on holiday at the time, and I was reading increasingly concerning reports of the viral infection in China. And I contacted my office and said, I think we need to start getting SAGE ready in case we're needed. SAGE was called ultimately at the end of January, but throughout January, we had a number of meetings, January 2020, this is a number of meetings, um, beginning to work out what the um, response needed to be from a scientific perspective. And I was looking back at some notes from one of the meetings that we held on the 27th of January uh, with research funders trying to work out what research funding approach should be taken to get the country and indeed contribute to the world response. And some of the things that came up in there I think are relevant to this point. The first was that it was necessary to have a rapid research call, thing that could respond really quickly so people get money out of the door quickly to groups that needed it across the whole spectrum of science and engineering. The second was 
it was clear right from very early on that vaccines were going to be an important potential way to deal with this. We didn't know it was going to be possible. And interestingly, we thought that messenger RNA vaccines offered a unique and potentially fast way to get into this, although they were untested technologies at that time, it seemed like a sensible thing to try and back, and that there was a need, therefore, to think about manufacturing facilities and the ability to scale, as well as, of course, supporting the discovery so essential in those and viral vector vaccines. Manufacturing of tests was going to be important, how did the country scale its ability to distribute testing? And in the therapeutic, the drug space, screening of molecules to try and find things that might already be available that could be used occurred. In the end, they were picked up in clinical trials, but robotic screening of molecules was also a key part of what went on. And it's very obvious that engineering is involved in each of those things I've just mentioned. And I'm going to run through a few things that have been crucial during this pandemic where without engineering, they simply could not have happened. The first of those relates to data. Data has been instrumental across the world in working out how to take responses to this new infection. And initially, it was very difficult in the UK to get the data flows. Now it's in a good position with clear indication of data ownership, knowledge about data flows, ways to get data integration, ways to flow data integration into analytical hubs, turn that into information, and tools such as data visualization tools to be able to present that to decision makers to inform their ability to make decisions. Sequencing of the virus, both as a test initially, but also sequencing to pick up variants, genomic sequencing has been crucially important. And quite early, a group of academics from across the country got together to form a network to do this. And central to that were some big laboratories with big automated facilities like the Sanger Center in Cambridge to be able to do this at scale. And at one point earlier in the pandemic, about 50% of all the viral sequences in the world came from the UK. Now, that was a scientific endeavour, but it was, of course, absolutely to do with automation, robotics, and other things as well, and cannot happen without engineering. And if you look at the labs that have been set up now, huge automation and robotics has been crucial. Very early on, and it remains the case, we didn't really understand fully what the transmission routes were. How does this virus transmit? And in which environments is it most likely to transmit? That has been a problem right the way through, and we're getting more and more information on it. And what's been absolutely central to understanding that has been the work of engineers. And I will call out on this, uh, this uh, talk, Kath Noakes, who has been uh, absolutely key to this in terms of advice into government, trying to work out the environments and the transmission routes that are important and therefore that you can do something about. And of course, we know that ventilation and various other measures are particularly important to try and stop the spread. So engineers, in this case, people with expertise in, in computational fluid dynamics and in, in, in airborne transmission and building infrastructure and so on to try and understand what things could help. We know that early on ventilators became an issue and suddenly there was a rush of people with new designs for ventilators. And the manufacturing of tests, of course, has been an incredibly important part of mass testing in the UK and elsewhere. I'm not going to go into the details because it's obvious that all of that requires engineers and there is a legacy which is incredibly important. There's a legacy which is global. At the G7 meeting last year, a 100-day mission was adopted by the G7 as something that the world needs to go for, which is an aim to say for a future infection, you should have an early warning surveillance and detection system able to sequence pathogens early and get that information analysed 
across the world. And then to have an ambition within 100 days to have vaccines ready for production at scale, a test which is reliable and approved, and an initial regimen of therapeutics. You don't get to that sort of thing without really thinking about advanced manufacturing, as well as the discovery side. It is the advanced manufacturing which is going to be incredibly important to do that, whether it's distributed across the world, centralised, how you make that work for different vaccine types, different tests, different therapeutics is key. And there's a whole swathe of people working on turning that 100-day mission into a reality. It won't be a reality for every single new infection for many years, but you can do it for some sooner than others, and we've got to get on with it. The other legacy, a domestic one, relates to national um, risk assessment. So there is a risk assessment process that goes on in the UK, which now has been heavily informed by engineers, and indeed the Royal Academy of Engineering has done work to try and feed into this, to come up with a new way of thinking about risk assessment, an improved way of thinking about risk assessment, and of course I'll come back to data being critical to that. So my message in a way at the end of this is you can have all the science you want, but without engineers you will not give that impulse to invention and to its application. So whilst COVID in the UK and in many other places has some form of end in sight at the moment, at least in terms of transition to it becoming an endemic infection, that's not true for climate change. Climate change remains the major problem globally that we face. Of course, we need to decrease emissions, and that is going to be a combination of things, including behavioural change and decreased consumption. But there are two areas that I want to focus on. Invention and technologies and the implementation. So yes, we need to invent new ways of trying to solve the problems relating to carbon emissions. But it's worth remembering that if you haven't invented and discovered it now, the chance of being able to deploy that at the scale required, in the time required, is very low. So discovery and invention remains crucial for the future, but it's not going to get us out of this problem. So we have to turn to things that are either already discovered or already invented and ask the question about rapid implementation, deployment at scale. And you will all know that deployment at scale is a massive, massive engineering challenge. And this is one of the areas that's going to require huge focus this decade, deployment of existing technologies at scale to solve the problem while still investing in and supporting discoveries for the future. And that's true across many areas, transport, domestic heating, industrial processes, including things like cement, renewable energy, batteries, energy storage, nuclear power, maybe nuclear fusion in due course, and of course carbon capture. All of these require some degree of invention and a huge amount of practical development, deployment, and ultimately implementation. Each has massive engineering challenges, some of them absolutely formidable. So I want to make three points about what's required. For sure, we need innovation, invention, and deployment. And do not underestimate the deployment challenge. Do not underestimate the degree of ingenuity, invention, and engineering required in the deployment. The second is that the climate challenge and net zero is very complicated with multiple parts. It is a whole systems problem. And so systems engineering and systems thinking has got to be central to this. If you just take a simple example, well, relatively simple, like hydrogen, and you say, I want to do something in hydrogen, 
the number of different moving parts that come into play, and do you mean hydrogen for transport? Do you mean hydrogen for domestic heating? Where does nuclear play into this? How does the hydrogen get made? Even a single part is a complex system. And so we have a system of systems problem, which really requires systems engineering to think about it with one massive unknown variable, which is human behavior. So this is a problem for engineers to make sure that governments know how to think about this in an integrated way. And my third point is mitigation is clearly crucial, but adaptation must be remembered. We're going to have to work out the engineering solutions to adaptation. So I picked two examples, pandemic on the one hand as a key example, and on the other hand, climate change. But I could have done it for lots of other things. I could have said smart cities, national security, future healthcare, agriculture, our food supply. It's very difficult to think of a global challenge where, of course, science is going to be important, but engineering is crucial as well. So we're not going to be able to tackle these things that, as society, we care about and we need to care about without really understanding how we come up with engineering solutions. Let me come back to my role. I've talked about some of the priorities in what I think needs to happen. I've talked about science and engineering in government, and I want to reinforce the fact that having scientists and engineers in government is crucially important. They bring a diversity of thought, they bring a different approach to problems, and there will often be an engineering or a scientific answer in the middle of a policy question. Government also needs to be good at being a recipient of that advice, so there's a general upskilling across the civil service which is crucial, and indeed there are tools that need to be in place to make all of this easier. A second priority of mine is climate, and I've talked about the urgent need to make both mitigation and adaptation as a key priority for governments across the world. But the third area that I want to spend just a bit of time talking about is innovation. The UK has historically and is a great science base for academic and research across the board. By any measure, it comes out very well in the top rank of countries for science. And it's got better at turning that science into things. So the number of startup companies now is greater in the UK and the sort of high tech space than in other countries in Europe. And the number of um, those companies that turn into unicorns, so a company worth a billion dollars or more, is increasing and the UK is doing well in that. But ultimately, and you go back to this idea that the science has to turn into something useful, these have to become sustainable. They have to become larger companies that have a sustainable future. And there, we and lots of other countries are not as good at making that happen. And if you don't do that, if you don't get the size and the sustainability, then deployment growth becomes difficult. And there are many levers that governments can pull to try and enable that, from financing to skills to procurement. But in order to do that, it's important to focus on this scale-up point to create wealth, societal benefit, which is the ultimate aim, health, national security. These create advantages. And if you like, this is giving the impulse to inventions likely to be useful to the world. It's that impulse word. And lots of things are happening. And two examples which I think are important in the UK system at the moment. One is the formation of the Advanced Research and Invention Agency, ARIA, similar in 
concept to the ARPA organizations in the US, not because that's the only way in which you do high risk, high return work, but this is focused about specific types of high risk, high return work that have the potential to turn into completely revolutionary inventions. It's a particular way of thinking about the process and a funding mechanism to allow that to happen. The second I would just highlight is the recent formation of a National Science and Technology Council, a ministerial body chaired by the Prime Minister focusing on science and technology. Not focusing on what basic research do we fund, but asking the question, what needs to happen at a national level in order to pull the great science that's going on through into the practical, sustainable application, utilization by society, companies that can support that, and make it a durable impact? What are the levers that government's got to try and assist with that? And the fundamental idea is that this is so important to a nation and so important to a science and engineering rich nation like the UK that this is a fundamental prime ministerial accountability. It should be for any prime minister, any government, something that on day one a prime minister would care about national security would care about the economy and should care about science and technology application, utilization and delivery. And so this new committee and new structure should put science and technology utilization and application at the heart of government thinking. But ultimately, whatever structures you put in place, whatever opportunities there are to take the science through into application and engineering. This is about skills and people. And I've talked about engineers right the way through this in terms of their differences and the way that they can bring in different branches to solve problems. I've talked about engineers and scientists in government as bringing in a form of discipline-based diversity, a different way of thinking about things. But I want to talk about diversity in engineering itself. And we know across science and technology in general that we don't have as much diversity as we need. And we know that's true in engineering. So the Royal Academy of Engineering report um, showed that in 2016, of those people working in engineering, 8% said they were female. In 2020, 12% said they were female. So 50% improvement, but clearly still very low. 16% of graduates are women. 16% uh, of engineering graduates are women. And amongst major in engineering institutions on the boards, 30% of the boards are women. And there are similar issues around diversity in race and other characteristics. So we know across the world and in the UK, diversity is an issue in engineering. The problems that we're all trying to tackle are huge, important societal challenges. Exciting. Things that if we can solve, the world is a better place. And we know that big, difficult problems cannot be solved by monolithic thinking. They cannot be solved by monolithic groups that all look the same, have the same background, have the same belief structure, have the same knowledge base. And so diversity, and this is shown, I think, very clearly in startups and entrepreneurial businesses, diversity whilst being a moral, ethical, social good, is also fundamentally just a business good. It's actually what makes you more able to solve problems and to come up with solutions. So if there was an impulse, to go back to the initial purpose statement, there's an impulse because the problems are big. 
and diversity needs to happen in order to help solve those problems. So, you know, my, my appeal to, 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 to anyone listening who's thinking of going into engineering is it's a fantastic thing to go into for all the obvious reasons we've talked about, and it's fantastic for everybody. It's fantastic for people from all backgrounds, from men, women, different races. It is crucial that we get this diversity. And then the other part of the initial purpose statement was for the world. And so the next comment is that this is a global issue and it needs international collaboration and countries need to be open to international experts from around the world and that we can't solve this by being inward looking. This has to be an outward looking collaborative when we think about these big challenges. So I've given my view of why it is that I think just as it was in the mid-18th century, just as it was in the mid-19th century when this institute was formed, engineering in all its guises remains absolutely central to solving the big challenges of the day and is a way in which those challenges get settled. So the modern aim of this institute is improving the world through engineering and I think that's exactly what it can do. And it's been a great pleasure to have the chance to speak to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, we're now going to move into a Q&A session. Um, Patrick, just imagine I'm Laura Koonsberg and we'll, we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just while we think about getting the IT set up, because I know that um, the audience has had chance to feed in questions as we go along. I thought I might start with an opener, because um, I wrote this one down, as you said it, um, and it was in the context of government, and you said there's virtually no place where science and engineering doesn't have a role. And I think that just begs the question of how an institution such as ourselves, a learned society, um, can work more effectively with government and have a greater influence over policy. So, Patrick, maybe I can look to you for a response first yeah. and then to Peter. Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because at first, at first when you hear that, you think, well, that can't be right. And then you think, well, well, let's take some examples. It's clearly all aspects of transport policy have got to have engineering bits in there. Policies on issues relating to privacy come across issues of data ownership and data security. Um, issues relating to national security involve technologies of all sorts that are crucially important. Health. It's not all about medicine. A lot of it's about engineering and about solutions through engineering. So wherever you look, you know, you know that, that that's going to be important. So I think one of the things that, that I think uh, institutions like this can, can help with is you have experts and those experts will be needed from time to time. So getting a relationship which allows government to know I can turn to you and quickly, because very often these things need to be done quite quickly, get three great experts in an area that can come in and give technical, knowledgeable, authoritative advice that can help a policymaker decide one way or the other as to what it is they need to think about, and to understand the uncertainties associated with that, which very often only the experts really understand the uncertainty. So I think there are you know, two broad ways. There are the sort of conventional advisory groups, which um, are important, but I'm increasingly interested in sort of rapid access groups that can come together to provide really concrete advice quickly and then sort of leave again and go back to the day job, as it were. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really important point, isn't it? We, we were actually touching on it upstairs earlier when it's the rapidity of advice and the trusted source of advice. Yeah. And I think as a learned institution, we like to think that that kind of trust and neutrality um, is what we can bring. But uh, Peter... And, just, sorry, one, one other thing just on, on that. Sorry, Peter, to interrupt, sorry. but I, I think... I talked about systems approaches. I mean, government is fundamentally a systems <laughs> question. And, yeah. and, 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 and rigorous systems engineering, and I know it's not, this is not an engineering in a sort of physical sense that we often think of, but the principles, it seems to me, are very similar in terms of how you think about these complex interactions and where your biggest uncertainties are in those complex interactions. So I think systems thinking and systems engineering are important things to, for actually government to get skilled in. 
Okay, well, well thank you for, for, for that mentioning about systems engineering, which is one of my particular hobby horses. And uh, my own experience is, is, at least initially, in the truth in the field of engineering and how you put together relatively complex products such as aircraft or trains or cars and trucks and those sorts of things. Uh, and you've got to keep a, a lot of balls in the air at once. And I, and I don't mean like two or three, I mean like 10,000. Um, but I, I think as far as sort of influencing governance, government is concerned, um, I, I've probably changed my view slightly in that I think initially I tended to think in terms of policy papers and you know, learned pieces of work on, uh, on topics of the day. Uh, but I think the, the conclusion I've come to is that we have got a lot more potential influence in a rather unseen sort of way, where, you know, as you've suggested, we can be drawn in on specific topics. Uh, and we have within our institution, we have 65,000 professional members, and we have about sort of 4,000 uh, fellows who are very much at the top of their game in, in our field, in, in, in the broad field of engineering. And if, if their enthusiasm and knowledge uh, and so on can be brought into play, then I, I think it uh, you know, potentially can have quite a powerful impact uh, on the way that government is, is run. And as you say, the, the world is permeated by, engineer, by technology these days. You, you, know, you, you can't move. Um, I, I, when I was a kid, transistors were the thing. <laughs> and I, I remember buying one or two. And there's about three billion, apparently, in there at the moment. <laughs> yes, I did too, actually. <laughs> it's moved on a little, hasn't it? Yes. So, so let's then focus our attention on some of, you know, the topic tonight is global challenges. Um, our mission is improving the world through engineering. We've got some questions coming in around those, around those priorities. So um, Kerry Mashford asks... With the imperative climate change challenge, how is it that the proposed future homes and future building standards fall so far short of what is required? And, and what do we need to do as an engineering community, if you like, um, to make sure that new buildings are net zero and make sure that we really drive um, that kind of mitigation agenda? Yeah, well, I mean, it obviously is a crucial area. And, and of course, it's a very big challenge in the UK with an ageing housing stock. Uh, uh, to refit that is is a huge challenge. So this is a you know really really important area to get right for government, and it's one that has added, had an extra complexity added in the last two years, which is the apparent but I think unreal actually tension between infection uh, resistant environments and net zero. Because the sort of simplistic thing is, oh my God, I've got to open the window and I've got to shut the window. Um, it's not obviously that at all and you can do both and I know this institution and the Royal Academy are, are both doing work on this but I think um, the point is absolutely right and what this needs is expertise into government I'm very pleased that we've now got a, a chief scientific advisor in the right department who can act as a sort of uh, conduit to try and get that information in um, and this needs to feed in to what then becomes, and this is, I think, quite important for science and engineering advice. We can provide advice, and we should have provided advice, and we should provide the uncertainty associated with that advice. Ultimately, the decisions are political decisions and are difficult. You know, I mean, it, it, it's easy to say, well, theoretically, I can you know, think of a whole lot of building standards that would sort this out. There are one or two little downsides to doing that, and that's for politicians and policymakers to think about what to do. But I think, I think that, you know, it's a long answer to the question, but the, 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 the real message is, I think, engage with government on this because everyone knows this is a difficult thing to get right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and I tend to think of it as probably the, the sort of biggest and, in a sense, the most unseen challenge in the sense that um, you, can, you, you can visibly see solutions, for example, to low-carbon transport... Uh, to uh, wind power, solar power, nuclear power stations, uh, and things of that sort. But the simple practical matter of how we heat our, our homes uh, and our, our buildings, uh, and it's the sort of questions, you know, which every one of us asks each day, unless we happen to live in a completely new and, and uh, sort of environmentally friendly building, which I think Kerry does, actually. Uh, <laughs> Is, is, you know, how do we address this, this very practical challenge, particularly when houses last for hundreds of years? Mm. So difficult challenges 
another difficult challenge that you alluded to and is coming up in the questions actually is around diversity. So we've got two of our past presidents uh, raising issues around di diversity. Um, Isabel Pollock Huff simply says thank you and uh, thank you for recognizing that it's an important issue. And Carolyn Griffiths asks, you know, this issue in engineering has been around, you know, for a very, very long time. Um, and what can government do to really expedite real change? And after I've, you know, after you've had time to consider that, I'll perhaps come to Peter and ask Peter to say a little bit more about his views on what the institution um, is already doing mm. and, and perhaps should be doing in this field. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, and and, and it, it, it's a. Clearly, it's, it isn't something that government can solve. Um, the government can do certain things, but this is a societal issue. Uh, the one thing, I mean, government clearly can do things in education policy and um, uh, university policy and so on. It can help in those areas. But I, I do think there's something, and I'll be interested in Peter's view on this, about framing engineering in the right way. And I know you and the Royal Academy of Engineering and others are, tr are doing this. When I look at the global challenges, you, know, you ask any child about those global challenges and they want them to be sorted out. You know, they're interested in it. They, they want to see a solution to that. And actually, they know there are practical solutions to it. And that's exciting. And that's something that people want to get involved with. And very often, I think what's happening is that engineering isn't positioned quite in that way. Mm. And so people end up thinking of engineering as something different and separate from that rather than a problem-solving answer to the major um, societal challenges. And I think we've all got to work to try and get this right so that we end up with teachers and others encouraging as many different people to get, get into this field and into science. Uh, and I, I do think that's possible. We can see big changes. We can see levels of enthusiasm for these things quite high. And I hope, I hope we're on the cusp of seeing this changing. And the numbers are all moving in the right direction. But it'd be nice if they moved a bit faster. Yeah, it's that speed of change that's a challenge, isn't it? And, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't agree more. We've had these conversations before. I think um, if you want to get people excited about engineering, quite often the last thing you do is start with talking about engineering. Mm -hmm. You start with talking about the things that people really care about, those big global issues. But, um, yeah, we do, need to, we do need to start shining a light on that fairly soon. <laughs> Peter, your thoughts? Uh, well, two things, really. The, the, I think the first one is to be in a position where you can illustrate that um, the extent to which engineering pervades society. Uh, and my favorite prop, which unfortunately I don't have with me today for uh, events like this, is a Coke, is a, is a Coke can. I thought um, sure you were gonna say a glass of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would, be, that would be quite nice. Be but but, but uh, you know, the, the, a Coke can, it probably costs a penny or two to make. Uh, and yet the amount of engineering that goes into that, that simple everyday product it is actually quite amazing, and if you, you know, if you go to research labs, for example, in the packaging industry, you'd be quite, uh, quite astounded, in, in fact, by what you see. Uh, and I think getting across that, that engineering is, is a very broad subject, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's also integrated with, with design, styling, you know, parameters of that sort is, is very important. Um, I think within our institution, uh, and, and this, this I'm responding now as as much as anything to Isabel's point, is that I think it's very easy for societies like ours to, to sort of descend into sort of groupthink type of thing where, where, where people uh, stay, you know, they become stalwarts of the institution, if you like, and, um, and you know, are there forever. Whereas I, I think in, in our world, it's, it's far more powerful and we can, we can tap, if we can tap into the, the diversity of our 115,000 members, uh, then and find ways of, of recruiting people into whatever field it happens to be, whether it's education or, or science and technology and those types of things. If we can organise ourselves internally you know, to, to get a wider range of people from different backgrounds, different nationalities, different places in the world and so on, then I think we stand a much better chance uh, of, um, of generating that impact uh, mm. that everyone is looking for. Mm. So... Sticking with um, engineers and society, 
Uh, someone called Colin Brown here, who apparently was a former chief executive officer, but anyway. Um, <laughs> he's asking, are cities a good or a bad thing? <laughs> Do they not give population densities that lead to efficiencies of reduced travel and energy use compared to a uniformly distributed population? Alternatively, do they lead to supply chain issues and increased disease transmission? So what, therefore, should engineers be doing about that issue, about the historic migration towards the southeast of England? Oh, well, that's a, that's a different question, because um, there are cities outside the southeast. Yeah, there um, are. So I, I, think, there uh, are. I, I think clearly this is... Uh, actually a societal question rather than an engineering one about cities and why people choose to live in cities. And actually, it's, it, I'm, going to, I'm going to go off on a tangent for a bit, which is I talked about the National Science and Technology Council bringing together ministers from right the way across Whitehall under prime ministerial leadership because I don't think science, technology and engineering sits in one department. It actually affects every single department and solutions come from every department. So when thinking about, for example, new companies starting and growth companies and so on, if people are trying to attract people to an environment to be innovative and be creative and come up with solutions, it's not an abstract thing. People have to live somewhere and they have to live somewhere they want to live and they have, want, have to live somewhere where they're going to interact with people they want to interact with. They want to go to the theatre. They want to go to restaurants. They want to do things that make us human. And therefore, in thinking about a strategy to improve one sector or to level up or whatever with science, technology and engineering, if you don't also involve, for example, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, mm. you're not going to achieve it. So... Um, that's a sort of broad point. I, I mean, I can't tell you whether cities are a good or a bad thing in the, in the d domains that, I mean, I can tell you that clearly crowded living, and you can see in a pandemic, cities are where these things take off. And I also know that they take off most, in the most disadvantaged groups in cities where you can see spread occurring early. And I know, for example, they'll spread more rapidly amongst young people in crowded environments that older people tend not to go to, like nightclubs. So, you know, there are all sorts of things that, that, that lead to disease spread, but it doesn't make them a bad thing. Mm. And so I, th I think um, the question from an engineering perspective, it seems to me, is not to try and change our human instinct to want to live in certain places with um, other people and to interact, but actually to ask the question, what are the things we can do to make that safer? And uh, that's where I think smart cities become important. Um, I think things like transport become incredibly important ways of thinking about um, uh, um, changing transport infrastructures um, and ways of thinking about safety of transport as well um, and cycling routes and all those things become become important. So I think I think engineering is part of a different answer to a slightly different question, which is how do you make that safer and better? Yeah. But I'm not going to answer the question about whether cities are a bad thing. I, per <laughs> I personally rather like living in a city, and that's where I want to live. It was very interesting, though, wasn't it? Do you remember at the beginning in particular, I think there was lots of people ex you know, yeah. you know, exiting cities and setting up in the country, and then I think that shone on a light on the uh, engineering challenge of getting good connectivity. <laughs> we all uh, went through that at some point. Mm. Um, Peter, have you got anything to add on this subject, or shall I move us on? Well, I, I think that the, the, uh, the perspective I would have on it is that uh, you know, people move to cities for a variety of reasons, uh, but I, you know, high-value jobs, if you like, is, is one of the sort of drivers. Uh, and I think that uh, if, in a concerted manner, uh, governments can encourage uh, universities uh, early stage research organizations and things that sort of underpin uh, engineering and manufacturing, which does generate very high value jobs as well as exports and all those good things, then I, I think that that is, is, that is a means by which, the, uh, I don't particularly like the term leveled up, but, but I think it's a way of sort of evening things out a bit. Uh, and so I, I'm a, a big enthusiast, for, uh, maybe because I was involved in them, but if you take, for example, the catapult networks and the way they work between uh, universities and industry and so on, and the way that they can uh, sort of generate new ideas, turn them, take ideas and, and turn them into 
uh, valuable com commodities, um, manufactured commodities, and so on, are a, are a good way of, of uh, bringing wealth to a region, uh, and that wealth then you know, promotes further wealth. So mm. that's, that's where I would be coming from. Very good. Um, there's a very nice open question coming in, which I'm sure is something of a gift for you, Patrick. It's come from Helen Meese, who asks, what do you see as the best technical innovation in healthcare over the last 175 years? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, um, undoubtedly, the intervention which I think has had the biggest impact overall, if you ignore things like hygiene, which have been incredibly important, so basic hygiene standards, of water purification and so on there. I think you quite quickly get to vaccines actually as being crucially important in terms of the impact across the globe. Um, and um, what's exciting about what's happened now is the vaccine technologies, which have been pretty static for a long time, have suddenly changed quite dramatically, opening up a range of new possibilities. So fundamentally, both of those areas I picked on are disease prevention. And um, prevention remains a much better way to deal with healthcare problems mm. than treatments. Uh, you know, I can go to all sorts of things on treatments, but I think prevention is the answer to global improvement of healthcare. Mm. Mm. Okay. I, I think the engineer in me sort of says that the, you know, the most exciting thing about medicine are, are the various forms of instrumentation and the, the ability to peer inside the human body and, uh, and so on. And uh, you know, lar large magnets and big detailed maps of what's going on in your in your body. Um, but at a much more prosaic level, uh, one of the things I keep tracking is how many COVID doses have been uh, administered in the world. And it's about at the moment it's about eight billion. So someone somewhere has done a lot of good engineering work and a good manufacturing work to get us from January. 2020 to uh, 8 billion two, mm. two years further on. Mm. Uh, yeah, and that's, I mean, as I say, that's, that's rather mundane, <laughs> but it's very effective. But well, it, well, it's an essential part of yeah. our ultimately yeah. delivering mm. impact. Uh, honestly, you know, the, the, the challenge at the beginning of the pandemic when we were thinking about vaccines was there was a, a discovery question, but there was a massive manufacturing question. Mm. And, you know, the, the bottleneck was going to be, how do you make these things in scale and where do you do it? Mm. And um, solving that is, has been an incredibly important part of why there are 8 billion mm. um, doses. And, you know, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, I think, has been incredibly important because they've also done that at cost. I mean, it's been a low-cost mm. way of doing it. So I think, you know... The, that manufacturing side of it. And it's, the, it's the bit that's often forgotten. It's particularly forgotten, and I can say this because I was a, an academic for many years, it's often forgotten in academia. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I've discovered it. Oh, brilliant. I've done mm -hmm. it. Well, mm -hmm. actually, you've done a bit of it mm -hmm. because the real challenge then is how do you turn that into something and how do you turn that something into scale? Mm -hmm. And it's back to that systems thinking, isn't it? We've got an interesting question coming from Siddhartha Kaskir who says he's pleased to hear... Um, uh, your emphasis, Patrick, on systems thinking. In a world where systems engineering skills are becoming essential, there are very few university courses, degrees, or other taught courses on systems engineering uh, leading to an acute skills shortage in this area. Um, what do we need to do about that? Well, one of the things that we've been doing in government is actually making sure that we do link with where there are good courses in systems engineering. And we've got um, a series of offers now uh, for civil servants in systems thinking and systems engineering and various um, policy fellowships in systems thinking to try and upskill across the civil service. And I think it's really taken hold now that this is a crucial part of how you think about things. We've had seminars for permanent secretaries on where systems thinking can make a difference. The policy profession has adopted it. So I think right the way across the civil service now, there's a recognition that this is important. That, of course, is, is worth um, remembering because things like the Department for Education can then start asking questions about where all these courses are and whether there are, are, are enough in there and if this will start pervading I think lots of places I mean you know everywhere you turn now people are worried about systems and two things I would say are coming up maybe three systems thinking and systems engineering one secondly data visualization mm. as a key area and um, for those who didn't see it Kofi Annan 
a couple of years before he died, wrote a rather wonderful piece in Nature on his exposure to, system, uh, to data visualization and how it completely changed the way he thought about Africa as an African. And I thought you know, it's a very compelling piece very he, he wrote, um, very powerful. So I think, I think uh, you know, that, that's uh, um, an area that's, that's really important in this. And I, I've now completely forgotten what my third point was <laughs> on, on, the on, on Kofi Annan. <laughs> Peter, why don't you help us out? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you've got some views on systems engineering. Well, I have, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, was, I was reflecting that when we were looking at George Stevenson, for example, and I, I read his presidential address recently that he gave 175 years ago, uh, and it was, it was incredibly practical. It was all about engines in mines and fiddling about with pipes and seals and things of that sort. And, you know, the, the engineers of that day uh, were essentially practical men. Uh, we then moved into a, a, an era when theory was developed and, and taught and so on. And uh, I, I mean, certainly when I did an engineering degree, you know, I, I was taught theory till it came out of my ears type of thing. Um, and, and then we move on to sort of the, the business aspect of engineering. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you link those practical and theoretical issues to, to, the, to the business uh, of, 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 eng of, of engineering. But I, I think there are, there are three topics that interest me today, which have, have all been sort of, t or at least two of them have been touched on. One is sort of system engineering, in the sense of how do you pull together um, a very varied and uh, diffuse set of requirements and uh, conflicting sets of requirements and so on. Secondly, what role does data play in that, and how can you take data which is you know, hitting us in voluminous quantities these days and make sense of it. Uh, and the third thing is the, the route by which you take ideas and products uh, that are, are at an early stage of thinking and how do you mature them through to a, a, a point where they, they are made in quantity, they are reliable, uh, and they are cost effective, uh, and people want to buy them. It's really interesting. A lot of what you're saying is really coming through on the questions as well. So I was just looking at one coming from Andrew Smith, who says, you know, although we can continue to re research new technologies, the emphasis has to be on current technologies to be deployed at scale. So mm. exactly the point you're making. And then he asks, so looking at these major challenges for climate change, what do you think needs to be scaled at pace to have the highest level of impact? Well, th this is, it's really interesting because it's where this, this is a systems challenge. So to pick on one thing and say scale that at pace isn't going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And there are loads of things that need to be scaled. And there are some that are very obvious and you can get on with now. So um, you know, would it be great if we could move faster to get EVs out across the UK and to have a charging infrastructure that allowed everyone to suddenly want one and a price point at which that could happen? That would be something that you can see. And then you, you get to... The challenge that Peter's mentioned, which I agree, is the big challenge, domestic heating. <coughs> what are we going to scale? Are we going to scale hydrogen? Are we going to scale electricity? Are we going to scale heat pumps? How are you going to do that in cities? Are we going to have waste systems from uh, nuclear that are going to help with that? I mean, these are, this is why, actually, the R&D imperative, in my view, across net zero is to as quickly as possible get the R&D that gets you to an answer as to what you want to scale. Because if we don't get to that answer and we live with continued uncertainty for a long time, we're not going to scale anything fast enough. And given that we've got to get to this as soon as possible, we have to do that. So I think taking the questions we have on every area across net zero and working backwards from 2050 and saying, what is it I need to know that I don't know now that would enable me to make a decision becomes the R&D question. Then when you've got an answer to that, you've got the big challenge of how do I scale that, which should be done in parallel. And I think that's, that's the way we need to approach it rather than picking on individual things and saying, if I scale that, I've solved it, because you haven't. Mm -hmm. Well, you've, you, you can't jump straight to that conclusion, can you? Peter, your perspective? Yes, I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting situation if you're an observer. Uh, and I, I made the point in my little introduction, uh, which I've made several times before, that you can, in the context of climate change, you can see a process of natural selection developing. 
and you know you've, you've got a whole raft of different answers and you know year by year you find out a bit more about each one and which is most cost effective and more money gets put into it and eventually you know in 40 50 years time you've got a, a solution that works and the system rebalances uh, and it's more a case of how do you, but how do you accelerate what otherwise would be quite a slow and tedious process uh, and uh, I, I for example uh, think a lot about the, the field of commercial vehicles because I happen to work in that uh, and uh, from what I can as, as did Paul and uh, from what I can see there are four or five quite different and possibly workable solutions to the present day which is diesel power and so you, you could have battery electric you could have hydrogen fuel cells you could have hydrogen um, internal combustion engines and, and you could have diesel with a carbon capture system bolted on the back and there are probably others I've not thought of so, so how, do you, how do you take those five contenders? And, and you've, you've got to organise a race in a way, haven't you? You've got to put money into something that produces the answers, that tells you that when you've thought through these things properly, this is, this is how it would work. And this, is, this, this will give us a, a cost-effective answer. And that, that, for me, comes back to, I, I think there's a sort of R&D experimentation bit. Yes. You know, how do you make that decision by mm. putting a head-to-head -head comparison of some sort mm. and then what sort of demonstrator facilities do you need in order to be able to scale these mm. rapidly mm. Mm. and i and i think um sadly i will have to draw us to a conclusion shortly but let's just pause for a moment and think about you know the right type of engineering and the right type of engineers that we need to deliver the global challenges ahead um, Martin Aston has come in with this question asking about our engineering ecosystem. Um, is it ready to handle the level of technological disruption and system level solutions that we need? Um, I, I, I could put the same question a slightly different way and I, and I will do to Peter and it's a little bit turkeys for Christmas. Um, but you know, is there a role for mechanical engineering in the sector at large? Does that term still apply today? Does it make sense? Well, this is something I've thought about quite a lot. And, you know, for us, it's a sort of branding issue almost, uh, putting aside everything else, in that, you know, the, the, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, I can tell you, is, is world-renowned. You know, I've been to places on the other side of the globe when you, you give them your business card. They say, oh, you're a fellow of the IMEC ERU, and they, they sit up and take notice. So there is a branding issue for us. But, but in practical terms, of course, uh, mechanical engineering is, is a much broader field. Uh, we still have mechanical products, though. We still have trains, we still have aeroplanes, cars, blah, blah and so on. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, since 1847, they've grown brains. Uh, and, you, you know, you, 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 wouldn't, uh, you, you wouldn't be a, a competent medic if you could do everything apart from the brains. Uh, and so, so I think the, the scope of mechanical engineering, whatever you care to call it, is, um, uh, is so much broader. Uh, and people do have to understand particularly um, electronics and particularly software. It, it, I found it very interesting that, um, that uh, we run five cha uh, student challenges uh, each year uh, and people come along and they, they provide mo model trains or cars or whatever, or real cars in fact, um, against the standard. And it was interesting watching all of them. The, the thing that they were all wrestling with was the software. <laughs> So if there's a gap anywhere, it's that. <laughs> <laughs> and your perspective on how we train engineers for the future? Well, I, I think exactly this point that actually it's the global challenges and the problems that we're trying to solve that should be the driving force of how you think about training. And so, you know, those challenges, not all, only the global ones, but the other ones, are the things that define what skills you need, and we're going to need people that have different forms of engineering backgrounds in order to tackle some of those problems. And just as in every other field, interdisciplinarity is going to be important. And yep. so the, the real challenge across all fields, I think, is how do you get discipline expertise deeply, which we know you need, yep. and you get interdisciplinarity in the single individual so they can swap across areas. And get innovation at the interfaces. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Sadly, we have reached time, so it just falls to me to say 
An enormous thank you for coming on this evening. It's, it's been a really, really enjoyable uh, talk and a really stimulating discussion. That I've certainly found it really, really inspiring. Um, and, and I'm really inspired. And I think you have to reflect that when I listen to your talk and I've listened to and looked at some of the questions coming in, um, you know, there's a lot of alignment actually around those key global challenges. We're really excited here at the institution that we'll be launching a new strategy uh, this year, and that strategy will identify um, policy priorities for us as an institution, and broadly, they will fall across climate and sustainability. We've talked about that a lot. <laughs> uh, future transport, infectious disease control, and education as that kind of foundational factor that really um, underpins um, the, the pipeline of the next en engineers that we'll need to solve those challenges. Um, so really, really thank you for your, for your time. Thank you also to, um, uh, to staff and to members. Um, we remind ourselves that today is the 175th uh, birthday of the institution, anniversary of the institution. And uh, all of you, our, our dear listener online, um, all of you and in the room here are part of the institution. Indeed, you are absolutely the most important part of the institution. So in closing, I would just like to say a very big happy birthday to us all and good night. Thank you.